not have a formal introduction, and I am grateful uh, that Professor Mast will give her own brief introduction. Uh, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome, Adesat. Hey. Hey. Well, thank you for inviting me to the first adult forum of the season. I'm uh, Joy Mast. I am one of you. I'm a member of Christ Church. I got married here to my husband, Jerry Mast, um, in 1989, and um, I'm delighted to come and share some of the um, work that I do. And today, the adult forum and the green team, we're interested in trying to broaden a perspective. So the perspective I, and the, the purpose of this particular forum class is to get you thinking about your planet bigger, longer, deeper. And so we're going to go back to the beginning of the planet. I want us to think about climate change in the way a geologist might or a geoscientist might. And we're going to link to climate change, changes in life, evolution of life, death of life, and then bring it into people and think about how this impacts us. And instead of starting at climate change like in 1840 or, you know, it's sometime where it's like, okay, industrial revolution, I'm going to try to give you the perspective of what a geologist might think. And so that's my goal today. I'm going to go nice and quick through it because all of life of 4.55 billion years in a short amount of time. It's just going to fly by, but um, I will give the PDF to Father Seth. This is a recorded talk. You can come see it. I made some handouts if you want to see it later. The point is for us to just immerse ourselves with the idea of very long scales and then think about, okay, now that we're thinking about the earth in this kind of a light, let's talk about climate change a little bit. So that is my goal today. So um, happy to be here, happy to be thinking about climate change and human impacts with you today. So before I do anything with walking us through life, I want to get just the basics of what climate change might be and a, a system in and out of balance. And so the only background kind of science thing that I want us thinking about is that the sunlight's coming in and Earth is re-radiating out energy back. And when that's in balance, we don't have climate change. The climate is stable. When we have more of one and less of the other, that's when we start changing the climate. And so the idea of the sunlight coming in and the Earth re-radiating out long wave heat energy, um, that brings us into the idea of what might cause a climate to change. And so what the main thing that we're going to eventually get to is the idea of human impacts and greenhouse gases. And so one quick kind of thinking about what do I mean by greenhouse gases and why is the atmosphere important? So this is going to be kind of our, our background, so greenhouse gases. So I'm going to show you three slides real quick on what causes climates to change. And then we're going to dive into the deep history of the planet. The first kind of idea of thinking about why climates change is the idea of Earth-Sun relations. So where are we getting our energy? We're getting it from the sun, and then we re-radiate out that energy back. So how can we change kind of climates? We can have more or less sunlight. And this is a natural ph phenomenon that we can't do a thing about. So we have these uh, cycles. Some of them are on a shorter scale, like 21,000 years. Some are a longer scale, 100,000. But cycles of how the Earth revolves around the sun, sometimes closer, sometimes more of an oval. It has the tilt of the planet, sometimes we're tilted more towards it, sometimes less. We have a wobble to the planet. All these kinds of things we can't control, but they're going to cause major climate changes. Our second idea is that plates move. And so plate tectonics, as a geology type person, I'm all about showing you that, that what your picture of the planet right now is just a snapshot in time right now. Over time, we've had uh, a lot of movements of the land. And when the land moves, it's going to change our climate. If I move a lot of our land towards the poles, that's a cold area. It's going to ice over. All that ice is going to reflect that sunlight back into outer space, and that's going to make it even more cold. So we're going to have this kind of positive feedback and get colder and colder. So if I start shifting where my land is, I can change the climate of the planet. So we're going to see that happen over and over again. Um, and third and finally, that thing I mentioned before, atmospheric gases, greenhouse gases. Well, if you're thinking about the sun coming in with its sunlight, a lot of it gets blocked. Um, the part that actually eventually comes in and hits the planet, that has to leave again for us to stay in balance. And we have parts of our atmosphere that will absorb the gas for a while and eventually let that heat of the long wave radiation back out. We call them greenhouse gases. And they're natural, they're part of the planet. And I'm going to walk you through the, how the atmosphere has changed over time. But some of the greenhouse gases that have this ability to kind of, in the lower part of the atmosphere, hold on to the, our outgoing Earth heat for a bit before releasing it are things like carbon dioxide, methanes, nitrates. Even water vapor will do it. So those are our greenhouse gases. And so here it is. 
Earth's history. I hope you just enjoy and get the perspective out of this of how impressively long Earth's history is and how our portion of it is so very, very, very tiny. And then how much change has happened to our planet over time. So let's try to read one of these. So here is the start of the Earth. And it's kind of like a time clock. We're going to go around it all the way to now, which is where we are. So Earth's history itself, we're going to start way back at 4.55 billion years when the Earth started. I'm going to walk you through, and as things happen to life, those are the colors around it, I'm going to talk and stop and tell you what happened. And I'm going to show you how the climate's changed over time as we go. What you might notice is from here, from the origin of life, all the way over to this first next line, that's all a time period called the Precambrian. Precambrian is about 80% of life's history. And then we're going to do the kind of the, the most recent parts. And then we're going to divide those up into three just broad areas, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and then Cenozoic. And then we're going to bring us in. You don't have to remember any of the names of these things. And I'm going to tell you the dates each time. The point is not to minutia and think about it too much, but the point is note over and over again the planet massively changes. And so let me tell you the story a bit of your planet. Let's start with the atmosphere, because the atmosphere is so important. Think back to the beginning of life, or beginning of the planet, 4.55 billion years ago to about 4 billion years ago. We just got bombarded by outer space. Things are hitting the planet. We don't have a solid crust. It's all molten lava. Our atmosphere has no what you think of an atmosphere. Our atmosphere at this time had cyanide. It had ammonia. It had methane. Um, there was water in it, but there was no water on the planet itself. And so what you're thinking of the planet Earth is just so very different. We have no indication that there was life on Earth. Now, it could be because there was no ability to have a fossil of a bacteria at this time, but we don't have any um, we don't have any life quite yet on the planet. Kind of the vision of the beginning of the planet, and eventually, by about 4.5 billion years ago, it's starting to solidify. We're starting to get some plates and some continents. So let's go to our second atmosphere. Our second atmosphere is starting about 4-ish billion years ago, and we're going to go to about 3.5 billion years ago. And here, we stop the huge bombardment of the planet by all those asteroids and meteorites and all the rest. And instead, we're going to have a planet shaped by volcanism. Volcanoes are going to spew out. All the plates are moving, and the volcanoes are going to give us a lot of volcanic gases. And some of these gases are water vapor. So water vapor, 68%, 3 quarters water vapor almost. Um, it's not even really part of our atmosphere right now for that. Carbon monoxide, we don't want that, right? That's, that would be bad. Nitrogen and hydrogen. This is when we're going to start getting things like our hydrosphere, our oceans, are going to start to form in this. And we get our very earliest life on Earth. We get the bacteria. So um, what you might see here is, do you see any oxygen on my list? We don't have oxygen in our atmosphere. So the bacteria we mostly have at this time is called anaerobic, meaning it doesn't have oxygen. So it's living off sulfur and methane, and maybe it's in the deep ocean. That's the other thing. There's no land life. This is all ocean life at this time. Things are about to get radically different. This is our third of our four different atmospheres. We have a new life form that's going to come in. It's, you might call it blue-green algae. I would call it a cyanobacteria. Um, that's a little picture of it. It is the first kind of life on Earth where it has the process of photosynthesis. We haven't had photosynthesis before this time. And photosynthesis is a process where it's going to be taking in carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight and some water and releasing back oxygen. We're going to oxygenize our planet. This is going to take a really long time, though, because as the oxygen it gets added to the, the planet, the oceans are going to take a lot of it. It's going to make our oceans turn red because there's so much iron-rich rocks in the ocean that it's going to go through all of this um, weathering. And you get all those banded iron formations and things in this time period. It's going to take a while, but eventually we are going to get enough oxygen that we're going to call this our first kind of a big thing. It's the great oxygenation event. It's the first major thing that life does to the planet. And it's our first real big mass extinction. Because guess what? Oxygen is super toxic. And if you're an anaerobic bacteria and you start changing the oxygen, they're going to crash. So we're going to have our first big mass extinction. We're going to have a changeover in life on the planet. It's going to take a really, really long time, but we are going to kill off a lot of our anaerobic um, bacteria as this new stuff takes place. In this time, we have something else kind of big that happens. We have a change in the climate. 
And in this time, it really did look like this. It was called Snowball Earth. We have a complete covering of the planet by ice. Now, I'm going to show you later what the Ice Age was and what we think of ice. Ice Age for that maybe came down to Wisconsin, but from there to the tropics, that was an ice. This is a time period where the whole planet becomes covered. What started it? Believe it or not, volcanism started it again. Kind of funny, but the volcanism in this case was near the equator, and it put out a lot of rocks, and when the rocks weathered, it ended up on consuming or taking in a lot of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. When that gas plunged and we had a lot less carbon dioxide, it got colder and colder, we had uh, global cooling. And so that's what our Earth would have looked like about halfway through its life, 2.3 billion years ago. How did we get out of it? Well, carbon helped us again. A lot of volcanism came in other parts, started spewing back out carbon dioxide. When the whole thing was covered with ice, there wasn't any way to have photosynthesis, there wasn't any more rock weathering, and so the carbon levels built up again. At this time, when we got done with Snowball Earth and we came out of it and started warming up again, we get our first kind of higher level uh, uh, life. Before this, we were all prokaryotic, which means we didn't even have a nucleus in a membrane. And now we're going to get to more R types, eukaryotic. So we're going to start to have organs, organelles. We're going to have um, nucleus kind of covered. So what happened? Why did we have this? We just came out of a massive snowball, um, and we're starting to warm up. And it was kind of cool. If you care about biology at all, this is what happened to it. We had some of this bacteria that was there. They kind of partnered up and created uh, a more highly advanced type of life. That aerobic cyanobacteria, that blue-green algae, started to get covered by an organism called a protozoa, and it became what we call chloroplast. Chloroplast is in your leaves, right? So they created a new kind of organ, and that's where photosynthesis now happens. And then some of the older, um, from the Archean period, cell bacteria, they also got incorporated inside the biology of this new life, and they got made into mitochondria. Mitochondria DNA, you might have heard of that. They're also the site of respiration for plants. And so thinking about kind of that tree of life and where we've been, we have prokaryotic, no nucleus, that's all of this stuff. Then we have, uh, that's bacteria. Then we have the old type from the Archean. And we're finally getting to the first time at the history of the planet, something a little higher. So having a nucleus, eukaryotes. We're 2.2 billion years into the planet. And we're finally to our climate that we have today. This is basically what we have. When you're breathing, it's nitrogen. You don't think about that too much. It's mostly nitrogen. You have about, at this time, about 21% oxygen you're breathing as well. And you think, oh, that's a lot of oxygen. I didn't have any before, right? But other times and periods, I'm going to show you, it actually goes way up in oxygen. There's, there's time periods where the oxygen goes up to 35% oxygen. And then everything kind of becomes huge, giant giant, giant insects, giant swamps, and everything else, tons of oxygen. Right now, we're balanced at about, uh, that, uh, about 21%. We have other things in it, and we think about carbon dioxide, and boy, we're going to talk about carbon dioxide today, but as a component of our atmosphere, it's 0.03%. So, so that's a really small component, but we're going to find it's important because it's going to have that greenhouse effect to it. So that is our oxygen today, and we're going to kind of keep that. All right, so let me now... Let me now tell you about life on Earth, okay? So, so far we've had some anaerobic bacteria, we had aerobic, now we've finally gotten the little eukaryotes and we're, we're doing pretty good. Let's branch it out and give us the entire tree. And to do that, what I'd like to do is walk you through life on the planet. I'm gonna start kind of after that snowball Earth. We're in the, the very end of the Cambrian. I'm gonna just call it late Cambrian, and then um, pre-Cambrian. And then I'm gonna work you through the, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And as I do it, the details aren't important, but I want you to watch the planet get cold and hot and cold and hot, and then I want you to see what life does. Why? Because we are about to get very hot, and we want to see from past history what happens when we get really hot. All right, so Precambrian, boy, I'm going to go from 1.1 billion to 544 million in a single slide. It's not that interesting things aren't happening, but it's a, it's a very long history. Let's think back, and one of the things I want us to think about is going back a billion years, we had a supercontinent. You might have heard of the supercontinent Pangaea and think, oh, we had a supercontinent. Yeah, lots of times. We've had supercontinents, they break, supercontinents, they break. We have another one coming up. I'll show you on my, one of my last slides. Back here was called Virginia. It was a big supercontinent. And when it started to break up, land masses started moving to the poles. Do you remember what happens when that happens? All that land mass moves to the poles, it gets cold. 
Cold causes ice, ice causes reflectance, boom, we're back into snowball. Twice in this period, we go back into snowball Earth and we get covered in snow again. That's never good for life on Earth, um, even ocean life. We get out of it because of volcanoes. Once again, volcanic eruptions put out enough carbon dioxide to get us back out of it. What's going on with life on Earth? Well, we don't have land life yet. We have, land in, we have life in the ocean. Um, we don't have vertebrates yet, so we have invertebrates. We don't have shells quite yet, so think soft-shelled, floating invertebrates, and a bunch of algae. That's kind of where we are. We're going to end this whole pre the late Precambrian with a mass extinction, and you're going to note geology, pretty much every time we end an area, it's because something horrible happens, some big event, and so pretty much the mass extinction events start something else, and that's how we do our geologic time. All right, so we have made it through 80% of Earth's history. <laughs> that was pretty fast. It was all Precambrian, and I'm going to do the remaining part of my talk before we get into humans, um, walk you through Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Um, and again, let's just think about life on Earth. The first big thing, we finally got out of our big snowball Earth. We had a mass extinction, and this is what happens after mass extinctions. Life. Life goes just crazy. We call it in biogeography radiation. So it all of a sudden just diversifies because there's all these empty niches. Nothing's there. And so we have this, what we call the Cambrian explosion. Explosion in a good way, where we all of a sudden have a massive diversification of life on the planet. It's all in the oceans. Some really cool things. So we start with uh, initially having shelled invertebrates. And by the time we end the Cambrian, we have hard shelled, which is still good. Um, we have a supercontinent called Gondwana, which we're going to watch that come and go over the time. And it's down here in the southern. Um, if you are interested in where is Wisconsin, I always like looking at where is Wisconsin on these maps. Wisconsin's right here. It's part of a place called Laurentia. It's right on the uh, equator. So we're right smack dab in the middle of the equator. But life is not on Earth yet. All right, so let's move forward. We're going to move to the next kind of grouping, which is Ordovician. Um, here we have a big new ocean. It's the uh, Atlas is named after At Atlantic Ocean is named after Atlas. The father of Atlas was uh, Iapetus, and so Iapetus is the father of the Atlantic Ocean. So kind of working through that. Um, Iapetus Ocean. Here we are in Wisconsin. Here's the Great Lakes. They weren't there, by the way. The Great Lakes were made <laughs> after the, about 10,000 years ago. But they're putting it in to kind of show you where you might be. It would be right there. Um, we have different kind of ideas, and we're splitting. And what's going on? We have our first life on land. And what's the first life? Was it reptiles? No, it wasn't dinosaurs. It was insects. And who will be there when we're all gone? It'll be insects, because insects are really, really, really favorable. Uh, they, they radiate really well. So first life is insects. It's not the insects you're thinking of, because there are no flowering plants. So there's no little insects that need to pollinate anything because there's nothing to pollinate. So these are very, very basic insects. They don't metamorphize. They don't pollinate. They're just coming out. We do have some land plants, and, uh, but they're not trees. And they're not big things quite yet. And how do we end this period? We lose 80% of everything that's alive on the planet in a mass extinction. Why? This one was crazy. We had massive global warming. But before that, we had a massive global cooling. So we went flipping from back and forth. We had a glacier cycle. We had a warming cycle. Um, and just killed things. Lots of things killed. Because when you have glaciers, all that water gets sucked up in the, in the, the lakes, and the, the ocean levels drop. And then when it all warms up again, it melts and rises up. It just kills lots of things. Which brings us to our next time period. We get out of this mass extinction, and the plates start to move again. Here we are, and Europe has joined America. That's kind of cool. Um, Gondwana land's still down there for that. And our land starts to have some invertebrates and some early plants. That's still going on. The oceans are getting more interesting. They have those big jawed fish. Have you ever gone to a museum and seen one of those big jawed? Yeah, this is the era that the jawed fish comes in. Continents start to collide. Devonian is when the lands and starts to get a little bit more interesting. We get ferns and seed ferns. We don't have so much seed ferns here. Um, but that was the kind of the plant of the day. Today, just for kind of, because I like trees mostly, today most of the biomass on the planet for the land is, is trees um, and, and that kind of thing. Back then, it's not. So land plants are really important today, 400,000 different species. Back then, just think ferns and a couple tree fern type things. What do we care about for life on Earth? We're going to come out of the ocean, right? This is when the lungfish 
develop into the amphibians. But what are the amphibians tied to? What do they need? They need water, right? Because they have to lay their eggs. So they can't go super into dry areas. So they're, they're not quite adapted. They're pretty well adapted to the, the environment they're in, but not, not perfect quite yet. We end this period with losing 75% of every species that's alive in the Devonian dies. And so why does that happen? Big, massive global cooling. With the global cooling, ocean level changes. We have an uh, anoxic event, which means we're going to take oxygen out of the oceans. That's going to kill a lot of things. Um, that was kind of an interesting reason. There's a bunch of algae blooms, just like you get like up north in a, in a lake, and you're like, oh, I, I don't want to go swimming. It's all algae. Well, that algae bloom, when it dies and it settles down, it absorbs, it takes up a lot of oxygen when it dies. And that happened in a global scale with the oceans. The algae had a big bloom, it died, and it took out the oxygen and killed the life. So here we are in the Carboniferous. You should care about this one. This is where coal comes from. So if you have wee energy and you get your coal-powered power plants, this is where the coal comes from, Carboniferous, this era of a lot of carbon. Um, we just killed a lot of things with a snowball, kind of an earth, kind of a scenario, very much cold. So this is a cold initially as we're first coming in. Ice is covering up the southern hemisphere, and uh, life has to kind of adjust. This is where we get my favorite type of being, besides people, of course, is conifers. So the conifers first come in, it's very cold, um, and they are adapted to cold, so they're the first trees. We have no flowering plants yet, right? So there still don't need the bumblebees and things that flower. We have just conifers, um, but the conifers are pretty great. We have the first ability to leave the water, reptiles. So what makes reptiles different from amphibians? They lay an egg. What's in that? Ambiotic liquid. So where can reptiles go? Away from the water. So they can get on the land, go deeper in the land, they can go to dry parts of the land because they are able to raise their young without having to go back into that swampy uh, water. All right. Uh-oh. We end this era with a mass extinction. So this happens again. We go through the uh, Carboniferous. We get some cold. What actually ends up doing is we end up having problems again with ocean levels of oxygen. Anoxia uh, kills off land and water plants. But now we have the biggie. So there's really five major mass extinctions besides the, um, the very first one, which I'm not counting, which is when we first got oxygen, the great oxygenation. I'm not counting the last one, which we're in right now, but five in the middle for geologic. So I put a red box every time we have a real biggie. I should put a double red box for this one, because this is the biggest of the biggies. Um, this is the great dying. So we had to call it something. So the great dying, 96% of everything goes dead all the species, not individuals, but the entire branching line of a species for these ocean species. And 70% of all the land goes dead. We are in the Permian. Here is the Permian, the late Permian. By that time, we've created kind of a, a massive continent that's just forming called Pangaea. Um, in the middle part, what you're seeing when you see green is kind of forest, when you see yellow, that's a desert. So we have kind of a, a big drying out. So what happens in the Permian is we have a massive global warming. It's very hot. It's very dry. Um, that causes all sorts of nasty things to happen. So why did we get it? We had Siberia erupt. And not like, oh, we're watching a volcano for a couple of weeks or something. It erupted for a very, very long time. China also had some massive eruptions. And so that put a lot of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, it changed the atmosphere, and with it, we warmed up too much. Bacteria then said, oh, there's a lot of oxygen. I'm an aerobic bacteria. Awesome. And bacteria went crazy. And the byproduct that often they put out is methane. That's another greenhouse gas. And so that also uh, increased it. And then all of that kind of increase of uh, the conditions created an acid rain. And that killed off a lot of things as well. It acidified the oceans. Oceans don't do well when you change kind of the pH balance. We're going to end the Paleozoic with that. We're like, OK, well, that was a lot. So that was a huge right dying. Let's start a new grouping. So this, after the Precambrian, we had Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. We just finished the Paleo. We're in the middle. We get to bring the dinosaurs in, okay? So the Paleo, we're done. We're in the Meso. We're in the Cenozoic right now. That's where we're at. So we're 250 million years ago. We have one massive continent of Pangaea. This is one of my favorite times to talk about it when I teach a geology class, because this is when Africa smashes into the east coast of, of North America. It gives us Florida. Florida used to belong to Africa. We're going to keep it as they break up later. This is when the Appalachian Mountains rise up 
Um, so if you like the Great Smokies or hiking around that area, it's a really fun time if you like thinking about geology. It's also kind of a fun time for us because we have the first mammals. We have arrived as a, as a grouping. So mammalia, they're not elephants. <laughs> they're more like little shrewy cat, rat things, but that's fine. So we finally make it into the scene. We are not dominant. We are definitely not the, the main type of creature yet. We're going to end the Mesozoic's first one. We call this the Triassic. Um, during the Triassic, you can see because it's all attached, animals and creatures have amazing ability to move around. So as a biogeographer, this is one of my favorite time periods because things can go from the northern hemisphere down to the southern hemisphere. But the period does end with volcanoes. And volcanoes spew a lot of carbon dioxide. Temperatures go up. 80% of all species on the planet die. But who comes out of this? As the winner, the Jurassic. And I don't have to introduce you to the Jurassic because I've watched every Jurassic Park movie. I bet you have too. We have the, the switch over to the true dinosaurs. They're the reptile branch. They can go all over the place. They, they, can, they have the ability to travel. This is pretty great. We're going to start to break up Pangaea. We're going to have an ocean come in. We're just testing this. The ocean's going to come in and break up. We get to eat Florida. South America and Africa, which have been attached, they're going to start to break up. Look at Australia. Look at where India is. India is part of Antarctica. None of it's at the South Pole. It's more like mid-latitude right here. Here we are in Wisconsin. We're kind of subtropical up there. For plants, those conifers, we're going to get to dominate. And we have, at the very end, our first flowering plants. Good. They're going to take off, and they're never going to come back. They're going to be dominant from there on out. So angiosperms finally are going to uh, come in. So Jurassic is the time of the reptiles. Look, no mass extinction, right? So we're good. So we're not ending this period. What else are we going to bring in? Well, the dinosaurs that are kind of uh, the leaders or the most dominant are the sauropods. Um, but this is the first bringing in of the birds. So uh, I'll show you how that kind of changes. And we're in our last part now of this middle period, the Mesozoic, called the Cretaceous. The dinosaurs still rule. They're doing great. We're going to have conifers not doing so great because the angiosperms are going to be better adapted, and the conifers are going to start to decline out. Dinosaurs rule. Insects realize there are angiosperms. And so all of a sudden, we have a bunch of wonderful um, evolution of insects to deal with angiosperms, angiosperms flowering plants. And so you have all the kind of adaptation that that insects do to take advantage of having flowers. Um, and what else do the mammals do? They're like, hey, wow, cool. Flowers, flowers, more insects. Let's eat insects. And so we have a lot of insectivore type um, mammals out there. And where are they? They are hiding. <laughs> so they're nocturnal generally, because you got dinosaurs all over the place. So they'll come out at night and they'll attack the insects, just like those little uh, forest creatures you might think about. And then we have another red box, our last of our five main red boxes, uh, mass extinction. We call it the KT mass extinction. You're probably just thinking, hey, the one that killed the dinosaurs, right? So the main theory that we still support is that there was that impact um, near Merida, Mexico, and the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, picture it like the size of a city coming down and hitting. It's not the impact that killed all the life, but the impact of um, that asteroid put so much dust and debris into the atmosphere Think back to my first slide. What comes in and what goes out. If it's trying to come in and it gets blocked by dust, it won't ever come to the surface. It'll just bounce back into outer space. And that's what killed the dinosaurs. The, the, the climate changed because we didn't get the sunlight. And so that was pretty bad. Besides the dinosaurs, it killed off 75% of all other life on Earth. So it was just a, a, a big global cooling kind of event. And here's the location. It's underwater, so you can't quite go unless you dive for it. But if you go over to Merida, Mexico, you can kind of see the, um, the area. What did the planet look like at this time at the late Cretaceous? Well, look at this. I could go and I could cross the ocean because there was no Central America. There was a north, we had a mountain area. The middle part, think of kind of the middle part like, oh, uh, the, our country was water. It was a shallow sea. We're in Wisconsin right about there. Let's take one good shot out of the dinosaurs because we lose them after this. Here's the dinosaurs. When they arose, um, they came off of branching about 140 million years ago. One of the branches kind of didn't stay, uh, didn't change much. There's a, a, um, one branch. And then the, the saurus pods came and they branched out lots of different types. 
And this is the one that got to stay, the bird. So we still do have dinosaurs, kind of. Uh, they evolved, they're not dinosaurs anymore, but they branched off of dinosaurs. So think of that next time you feed the bird. It's kind of fun. Our last grouping then is the Cenozoic. That's where we are. We're in the Cenozoic. Um, and I'm gonna give a shout out to one in particular. So you can break up the Cenozoic into two, I think, three different groups. Paleogene is the first one. Within them, they had different subgroups, one from Epoch. And the one I'm gonna shout out that I want you to remember is something called the Eocene. Why? Because this is where we're heading. This is gonna be kind of what I'll argue is our next climate type. We're gonna go to this climate type. So what was it like? Carbon dioxide was at about 560 uh, parts per million. We're not there yet. Thank goodness. But it's about double what it was, say, in 1850 or pre-industrial. We're heading that way. So it behooves us as you know, geoscientists and, and historians and all the rest to think, what was it like out when, when we were at that level of a carbon dioxide? Um, it was about eight degrees or more Celsius higher and hotter than it is today. Right now, we're kind of talking about one or two degrees. This is eight. So it was quite different. It was very tropical. Um, uh, it was a time period where, what did we just kill off? The dinosaurs. So who gets to kind of like go, empty niche, yay, us. Us, right? Mammals. Mammals go crazy. So we don't have to be nocturnal. We don't have to hide. There are no big dinosaurs. There's a lot of open niches and, and, and food and life out there. And all of a sudden, we radiate, which means we have branching of new species. Evolution goes just crazy during this time period. And I just picked out one to show you, because I always like this one. Here we are 55 million years ago. It's the start of the Eocene. And here's a branching. One of the branches becomes the hippos, like it. Another branch just becomes basically a wolf. And from that wolf, its descendants, it is branching, become ocean mammals. You ever wonder where a whale comes from, or an orca, or a dolphin, or something? They're kind of branching off of a wolf. And kind of related to a hippo, but more of a wolf. That's kind of cool. So we have some of the mammals that spent all that time and all that effort to get up into the land, think, hey, Oceans, there's a lot of food, there's a lot of stuff I could do, and they go right back down in, and they stay there. So those are mammals, they give, you know, milk and have to breathe air, um, and they go back into the ocean. I think that's cool. In the middle period, uh, second to last period that we'll talk about, um, we have the development of Central America is going to start to pop up. Why do we care about that? Well, if we had ocean currents that used to go across, now that current is blocked by land, and now it would have to go all the way down, and it ends up changing the whole kind of ocean circulation and where cold and warm and, and the, the movement of, of the oceans. We have this time period, a whole bunch of branching of the mammals, especially placental mammals, mammals that give live birth, um, and the area is pretty much subtropical forest. And that brings us kind of to us, my last of my kind of geology, quaternary or quaternary, that's our, we're, I know it's hard. It was easier in the 70s growing up in Wisconsin when we had snow all the time. We were taught, and it was true, we're in a glacial cycle. We are, we're in a glacier. We're in the kind of the up and down, you know, hot, cold, hot, cold. We're in something called a glaciation cycle. We're right now in a time period called an interglacier, which is this little time period in between the glaciers. But if we think about glaciers as Earth-Sun relations and tilts and wobbles and, and going around causing glaciers, we're in this cycle that would be cold. Now, that's been happening for the last 2.6 million years. It, we call that the Pleistocene. It's had time periods of, of glaciers and unglaciers. The last one I picked out, I like it because we call it the Wisconsin Glacier because it was the farthest that it went was the Wisconsin. And here's what it looked like for North America. Everything that's colored was glaciated. So Green, Greenland, like today, had a big ice sheet. North America, way down here we are. Here's Milwaukee and Whitefish Bay. We had about two miles of glacial ice above us. So when we look at our features around here and we look at cattle moraines, state forests, and we look at the moraines, that's all glacier carved. So that's kind of a cool sub thing. With this time, what was going on? We had kind of the, the time periods where things had to adapt, either to cold or warm. We ended in our last main glacier retreat, so the glaciers up here, the, pretty much Greenland's what's glaciated right now. We call that the Holocene. The Holocene happened about 11,000, 11,700 years ago. And we, that's kind of the rise of people. So I'm gonna walk you through one slide of the rise of people. But we have had pretty much civilization in this delightful inner glacier period. So we haven't had to deal so much with the ice. We have 
a mass extinction box that I gave. The first part of it is when the, the glaciers receded, people went and killed a lot of the megafauna, the really big stuff. So 100% of the stuff in Australia that was large got uh, hunted and killed out. We're in that same kind of a zone of extinction, and that's kind of another talk, but we have a lot of habitat loss, and that is also giving us this kind of mass extinction type event. Our extinctions are going quite rapidly, which is troubling. So I wanted to think about us. All right, so 2.6 million years ago, 2.6 million years ago, 2 million years ago is when Homo came into the scene. Mammals, so what are we? We're animals, yep, we have a backboard, yep, we're mammals. We're in a group called Homo. And the Homos came an, about two million years ago. They came um, off of this group branch. On dotted lines, that means they're not around anymore, they went extinct. But our branch came off of this red one, and here we are about one and a half million years ago. So we had different groupings came and went. And there's the Neanderthals. And eventually, Homo sapien, sapien. So it's a sub-branch of Homo sapiens, that's us. Homo sapiens sapiens came about 200,000 years ago. Um, we've mixed up with the Neanderthals. I think we all have a little Neanderthal in us, good on us. Uh, they're not around as a separate thing before, um, and they eventually, they were around to 50,000 years ago. That's not that long ago. Um, we finally lost that branch then. Extinction of them completely 30,000 years ago. If you think about it kind of geographically, here are the different types with the, the, the genus after it, and then the species. The broader, that means the more dominant, and here's two million years ago up to the present. Here's Eurasia, here's Africa. So uh, one branch came off to Europe, they died out very recently. Homo erectus came up, and here we are at Sapiens, and now we're everywhere. And we are everywhere. So that brings me to us, and that's good. Um, what I have to say with us is I'd like us just to ponder a second. The earth is going to be fine until it's not and the sun blows up, but that's really, really, really far off. Earth for life is probably going to be fine too, but what's going to happen to life? Life is going to go extinct, and then new branches will go and take advantage of it. That's what happens in life. Species last about a million years, maybe two. Um, genuses last about 10 million years. There's always exceptions. There's this really old fish that's lasted like 70 million. Horseshoe oh, crabs doing really well too, but generally things come and go. So think a little bit about we would like to stay longer. So we haven't been around that long. Again, how long have we been around? 200,000 years, and really we've been by ourselves only 30,000 years without the Neanderthals around. We're pretty youngsters. And so it is behooves us to, in our best interest to make conditions on the planet the best that we can. We cannot control Earth-Sun relations. We cannot stop the volcanoes. Uh, we can't stop plates from moving. We can control some of the greenhouse gases and not others. But we can control what we put out. So here is us. Here's atmospheric carbon. Here's 1750. Hanging out pretty well at 280 parts per million. 280. Here's your industrial revolution and all the rest. And here's atmospheric carbon. That's my brown line. My black brown line is emissions by people of atmospheric carbon. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Here it starts to go up and up and up and up. A little blip down right here. Um, we can do something about this. This is not a volcano. This is not, um, this is within our control. So the amount of extra greenhouse gases, whether it's methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, um, is something that we can try to return to a level that is good for our own life and the life of the other things that are around us at the same time. If you start messing with carbon and you start bringing it up to 420, we're going to get changes. Right now we're seeing changes that are kind of on the moderate side with a couple, couple, couple degrees. But what's going to happen when we see sumps right away? We, we'll see temperature. One of my earlier slides, and we went pretty fast, but as you have more greenhouse gas, it's just physics. Temperature rise. It's not debatable. It's not political. It's not votable. If you increase carbon, you're going to increase temperature. It's just a trapping of gas. With it, you're going to have changes in precipitation. And I'm going to show you a couple of that. Some places are going to get dry. Some places are going to get warm. You're going to have a change in snow cover. And if I don't have snow cover, guess what? Then I'm not going to have the reflectance back 
And so then it's going to absorb, and then it's going to get hotter. The positive feedbacks. The less snow, the less ice, the more it heats up, the quicker it goes. With that, you then start to mess around with melting things. When you melt things, here's a uh, change in sea level from 1800 to projected out to 2100. And they have the data for this. And then right here, it becomes then projective. Um, when, you, when you take Antarctica or Greenland and you release all that, um, number one is fresh water, and you release it into the ocean, you're going to change the salinity of the ocean. That's not a good idea. Uh, ocean life doesn't like changing things like that. And you're going to raise up the levels. And so all those, all, so many people on the, on the planet live right by coast, right? From Bangladesh to Florida. Uh, it's going to raise up the sea levels with that. You're going to have that acidification of the ocean. We've already seen that back in geologic time. It doesn't go well when you start messing with acids in oceans. Um, extreme events is what we hear about in the news a lot. More hurricanes, more intense heating of the ocean creates the low pressure, which creates the hurricane, which brings it over to our part, or the typhoon over in the, in the Pacific. Um, what I care about more is force, forestry, and so fires, climate change, insects that don't die and you get to survive, things that kill trees. That's a big change. And then think about your own health of, of bad air quality days, of excessive heat, um, of, of drought, of not having food, all the rest. So our food supply, our water resources, our infrastructure, ecosystem and health. So we can do something about this still. And so my last slides are two scenarios. We've got kind of a, let's not do much about it and let's return to the Eocene. And I will argue against that. That is kind of high emission scenario. This is what it would be like in the United States, uh, uh, year 2040. Wow, that's like 18 years from now, right? and by the end of the century. And they're showing you with just a temperature of how much hotter, and there's really no place I can move. I always think I'll move to the UP, but I think the UP don't, won't help. So we don't want that scenario. If we go with the lower emissions scenario, we're still gonna increase emissions. There's not much we can do about it. Gases stay around for a while, so even if we cut it right now, it's still gonna be in the system for a while. We have kind of the mid-century and end of century. Um, I think I'll move to the coast over here. It's not just the heat, though. It's also the precipitation. I'm just showing you the high one. And I'm going to show you this because I wanted to show that it's not just like annual. You can think about seasons. So the higher emission scenario means it's going to be wetter in the green areas and drier in the brown. And here's winter, spring, summer, and fall. So for Wisconsin, we'd expect uh, a wetter winter and spring, a drier summer, and a wetter fall. They're not horrible. But some places are going to get absolutely nailed all season. Um, for, for being much drier. So I'm going to leave you with four kind of what to do next positive thought questions to think about. My last slide to kind of show you the future is one, you can't change the earth. But two, we can at least change what we're doing to the earth and try to make it so we can last closer to our million or two million or beyond if we're lucky. Here is future conditions of the Earth in 2100, which is not in my lifetime, but it's in lifetimes of our, our kids in 2200. And the color scheme here I like is that they're going back in time that says, OK, the orangey area, that's, you're going to live like you lived in the Pliocene, or the blue would be the Holocene, nice and cold. This kind of orange right here, which is a lot of it, including us, is the Eocene. I don't want to live in the Eocene. I don't want it to be eight degrees hotter. Um, I know lots of bad things happen in the Eocene, and I don't think our plant, we will, will survive. Humans will survive, but not everyone, and it'll be pretty not nice to live in that kind of a climate. Going forward, what I want you to think about is that no matter what we do, the climate's going to change. Here we are, 50 million years in the future. What do we see different? South America, to start with, is in North America because the plates move. Africa has merged into Asia, and, and the Atlantic Sea is going crazy and out. Antarctica is leaving the pole. Um, and by 250 million years ago, we got another supercontinent starting to form, um, which is kind of crazy. Uh, we lose the Mediterranean right away. That's going to be gone. Your planet is dynamic. It's interesting. It's, it's going to change on you. If you want to be part of it as a, as a species, um, be nice to ourselves and try to make the atmosphere something that we can live with. So what can we do about this? I took this from Purdue University. I liked it. It's a nice way to wrap up today. Uh, there's four slides. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to leave it out there and, and share the PDF with Father Seth. One thing is just stop it already with the, like, 
Maybe the science says, no, it doesn't. We, we've known for a really long time what the science says. We don't have to debate anymore that carbon causes temperatures to go up. We don't have to debate that people have put more carbon dioxide. It's done. Just let that part go. So, so it's real. It's us. We agree. It's bad. And there's hope. That kind of sums that up really fast for you all. So what can I do about it? You can think about yourself. I always think that's a good idea. Think about your own impact on there's a, uh, there's a EPA has a really nice little household carbon footprint. You can think about, evaluate what you and your communities do. Small things are large, that's all great. You can talk about it. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for watching online. The more you think about it, and it's not just something they think, oh, I, I'm not gonna deal with that. At least you'll have some understanding. So talk about it. Have a connection, dialogue. Come at it with some optimism. Come at it with some persistence of, I can, I'll, I'm going to try to be uh, proactive about it. Think about ways you can do. And finally, shout out to Creation Care and the Episcopal Church, which I am a member of, um, Engage. So active citizenship, active, whether it is for the people in power. Um, I can't tell you how much a difference it makes, uh, who has control of things like the EPA, who has control of the Park Service, the Department of Interior, whether you have a four-year ban of mentioning the word climate change, or whether you have money and access and resources and things that are trying to go into dealing with it, whether the scientists quit and feel oppressed, or the scientists are willing to speak out. It matters. So the leadership, whether it's local, whether it's national, whether it's international, um, the support, uh, it matters. And so I left the uh, call as an Episcopal, we have a creation care, we have an organization that is interested in this. The church is interested in this. The church is not trying to bury it. Um, and I, I give a shout out to maybe getting involved with your own church. And that is my forum talk today. Are you willing to take some questions if they come up? Yes, and today I brought a ringer. I brought my husband, who is a professor of political science, whose expertise is climate change and the politics and environmental laws surrounding them. And so I thought when we get to that part, I'll pass my mic over to my husband, Sherry, who also got married in this church, so I figured it's fair, right? So fair, Depending totally on what fair. your question no? is, if I can answer it, if Sherry can answer it, between the two of us, uh, maybe we can help you out. So what's the probability that a super volcano will erupt and just ruin it all anyway? <laughs> okay, love the question. The question was, what's the probability of a super volcano? 100%, we will have a super volcano, absolutely. So I love disaster movies. I like watching them all. They're not gonna happen like the disaster movies. Um, you have, so I teach a geology in the National Parks class and we talk a lot about Yellowstone and you have the idea of this, of this hot spot sitting over Yellowstone and it's being a super volcano and it erupts every about 600,000 years and we're overdue. You can debate that. Um, it will erupt again. We, as long as we have magma and plate tectonics, we'll have super volcanoes and with those we'll have spewing of gases and it can cause global cooling for a while with all the debris. It can cause global warming with all that carbon dioxide. Yeah, it will happen. My lifetime, he's probably not asking me old, but uh, we will have that again. Yeah. And so life will have to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thanks. Do you like volcanoes? I like volcanoes. <laughs> Jim. Joy, thank you so much. You're uh, you, your enthusiasm is uh, something to behold. Thank you. <laughs> so, yesterday, yeah. I heard an NPR story about a man who started a company in Iceland, Greenland, whatever. You probably already know about this fellow who is developing technology to pull carbon out of the air over a great length of time because there's a lot of carbon in the air. Have you heard about this? What are your thoughts if you've heard about this or your husband as well? Um, <laughs> You have to. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, removal of carbon from the air, we have the technological capacity to do it. Um, it's not uh, uh, super challenging to pull it off. It's expensive. 
um, and energy intensive, right? And so um, my guess is we'll see lots of, of governments increasingly interested in this and putting money into um, research and development to make sure that uh, we continue to progress in our capacity to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. There's essentially only a few things that we can do. One is to reduce the emissions we put in. Another is to pull the carbon in the atmosphere out. Uh, another is to, I guess I'll push back on my wife a little bit, um, uh, manage the amount of solar radiation uh, coming to the surface of the earth. Solar geoengineering, I think that also will be a subject we'll hear more and more about as the years progress. Um, and then the fourth would be to adapt. Um, so all four are probably um, tools in the toolbox that we'll be employing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, hopefully we can use this to educate us in the long term. Um, Christchurch has had a green team since 2016. The National Church has a Creation Care website, which is really full of a lot of really good things. On convention last, the diocesan convention last year, which is now working collaboratively with all the dioceses, the three dioceses in, in Wisconsin, is um, gave a, a, I don't know what you call it, a commission to a commission <laughs> to create a creation care commission <laughs> for the diocese. And we're working uh, to do a presentation, a table, not workshop, but a table at convention. And um, Christchurch, since we've been doing work for a little while, has had good impact. And just pay attention, talk about it, and educate yourself and educate everybody and do it on behalf of every child you know, mm -hmm. every grandchild you, you want to live a good, happy life. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add on to that, um, oftentimes the green team's weekly email contributions are near the bottom of our weekly email, but it may be the most dynamic, um, content-rich, substantive part of our whole weekly email, and I speak as someone who uh, writes a little column every week. Um, so uh, sc scroll down a little bit, and you'll find an, inc an incredible array of local resources um, of, of, about all kinds of environmental issues. So just And if you're looking. interested, contact us, <laughs> because we can use more input. Um, and with that, I think I'll end it so that the folks that have places to go can end, but I'll hang out. So if you're live and have any questions, um, and if you're watching online, hello, and you can always reach me via Father Sachs. So thank you very much. Thank you.